This is the Dane Moore NBA podcast brought to you by Prize Picks coming at you Sunday night. It's April 29th, and we are recording this right after game four. Uh, the Wolves sweep the Phoenix Suns, go to the second round for the first time since 2004. We're turning these mics on right away afterwards. If you're if you're coming to the podcast for like a deep dive on coverages and <laughs> who guarded who, this is probably isn't the episode, but I'm excited we're doing... Uh, Multiple people. Kyle Tigey's here and Britt Robson. Uh, this is going to be fun. How are you guys? Well, the Wolves just swept. Uh, and they swept the team that a lot of people said were a bad matchup for them. Said Rudy Gobert would be played off the floor. Um, it's pretty could, satisfying. Just, this is, here's the thing. We could just not acknowledge those people. Like, well, that, no. That, I, that, I, oh, that, no, no, no. I I'm literally think, just pulling receipts no, no. one tweet at a time. I think that what is satisfying about it is that all the ways that the Wolves used to be maligned are now flipped on their head. I mean, the idea that the, the when this team needed to win when it mattered, they lost three regular season games to a team. They didn't play very well any of those games, and they just won four when it matters. Um, winning games when it matters is something that this team hasn't done in a very long time. And there's nothing fluky about it. That's the thing. They, they leaned into their identity to do this crushing. And uh, it really was any, there wasn't anything that happened tonight that really fixed the Wolves in a good way. It was all things going Phoenix's way for quite a long time. In That's true. And if they, Phoenix couldn't win tonight, desperation on their home floor would be both Booker and KD being very aggressive and scoring well. Booker had 49, KD had over 30. Um, Wolves are in foul trouble. Rudy absence was felt. Still lost the game. The Suns still lost the game. Um, they're not going to beat the Wolves in nine games if they played nine times. So wow. I'm sort of glad that Phoenix only waited four. <laughs> Kyle. And I just being petty is a skill and being petty is valuable and pulling receipts in this moment is important to me. I think it's important to everyone in this room because of what Britt just said. It's not just that they won in advance of the playoff, yeah. the second round for the first time in 20 years. It's how they did it. Two bigs can't work. They made it work, right? The Anthony Edwards stuff coming out of 2020 that he doesn't have any love for the game. He doesn't love basketball. After the game tonight, KD said, that's my favorite player because he just loves basketball so much. They're too immature. They're too, you know, they go crazy in big moments. What did, what did Tim Conley say after the game to us? Like, we were really mature down the stretch, right? right? We lose our head coach to a torn up knee and, like, we don't panic. The Suns threw everything at him. The whole kitchen sink. Maturity, cohesiveness, togetherness. They proved every criticism that has been said about this team and this roster and this franchise wrong. It was just like, even thinking back on the whole fourth quarter, I'm still just like, piecing it back together and and then there's all these different stories from from earlier in the game but my head is so much right now just kind of in the moment of you know, we just walked out of the stadium 15 minutes ago and yeah just like the the vibe of what it was like in in the hallways and jammed in there in the press conference room with Ant and Cat and I think like I, I kind of talked about this or Kyle we kind of talked about this the after game three, I, I thought this group, an Anthony Edwards led group with not just like, not to put Cat and Rudy as like role players, but like Ant at the top with guys around him. I, I thought that had a chance to really be something special. I honestly, in my mind, just like planning my life or whatever was like, that's going to probably be in a couple years, right? You know, like th this is going to be, more of a gradual build that I'm like setting this up like they just won the NBA finals they, they didn't but I just didn't think I would be feeling as confident about this team or just personal having personal belief in this team against almost anyone right now in 2024 mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying Britt right. like yeah it, it was it's just it's happened quickly like really the, in the last I mean since Carl came back even and like and what Ant has done, and it's like all of a sudden, like, boom! Now, now this team is here. 
they're playing a Phoenix team that punked them in the regular season, and then they just destroyed them. Mm-hmm. They just destroyed them for a week and only a week. You know, it, it's it's just it's it's happening fast, and I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around like the idea that this team is more than I thought it was. Well, I can tell you what is extremely satisfying for me about this is that this is a top to bottom um, execution job. Uh, you and I had a podcast at the beginning of the season, and we were both kind of down on the idea of we're running back Rudy and Cat, and sure. who knows if we can, you know, we called 46 to 48 wins. I think both of us pretty yeah. much called the same thing, thinking they'll be good, mm-hmm. but they're going to they're gonna run into that Cat-Rudy thing, and it's going to hurt them. Um, the opposite is true. The head coach... And the president of basketball operations were four square into this. They were puzzled a little bit that it didn't work last year. Then they said it was because Cat was out for 57 games or Rudy was hurt. I regarded those as excuses, a forestalling to what would be a growth process this year to kind of echo your expectation. And instead, we saw a ratification of Finch and Connolly's vision for this team. We saw skilled bigs, players who could play beyond what people expected them to be able to play like against a team that some fat cat hedge fund guy or whatever it was who bought the team and then immediately dismantled some of the best parts of it to bring together three stars whose skills are totally redundant and everybody wept with joy over the idea that the Phoenix Suns with KD were going to wreak havoc on everybody. Right. And meanwhile, the Wolves, the ever woebegone Wolves, with the Rudy Gobert, Mr. Overrated, and Ann, he's cool and he's coming, but he's not there yet. Right. Boom. One, two, three, four. KD, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal were helpless in this series relative to what the Wolves were doing. Mm -hmm. They were a step ahead, they were faster, they were tougher, and they had the best player on the floor. I like when he gets impassioned. It really gets just gets me going. I I, on that comment too, just as I'm just gonna only talk about pettiness, but like this series was really cool for me because it was the two biggest trades that have taken place in the last handful of years. Right? It was the Rudy Gobert trade, the Kevin Durant trade. A lot of criticism that the Wolves gave up more than the Suns gave up to give to get Kevin Durant. And to Britt's point, the reason you give all that up is because Rudy Gobert is the best defensive player in the year or in the league. He's gonna be a four time defensive player of the year. And even tonight, tonight was his worst game of the series, right? And everyone else picked him up, but that just goes back to what we talked about in October. Deepest team in the league. No matter what happened, you talked about it on Friday night after the pod, these different iterations. You can go to all these different things. Yeah. Saw a lot of Kyle tonight. Uh, mm-hmm. Kyle at the three that gave him good minutes. Uh, just gave so, you the willies. Gave I, me I'm the willies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it just they have so many different things that they can throw at a team. And every time I liked your boxing question post game, every time the Suns tried their last kind of grasp to throw something at them, the Wolves could counter. I, I have like a question for the both of you because I think, I mean, Britt, like you, you've done this forever. I mean, you've literally covered the team. The, the mm-hmm. whole time and and that is rare cool a lot of different things you've 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 seen it all and and as your friend and sitting next to you there too it's been cool to see you you know get to see this get invested right and and then and then Kyle too like it's it's pretty rare to like be able to and I mean and I'm guilty of this like I did grow up in Minnesota and like when I was a kid I went to Timberwolves games and stuff like that but since getting into the media side like more went into the reporter thing I think your story is cool and that you are one of the biggest media members in in the in the Timberwolves space and have done that while like keeping your fan identity that's rare and commendable so i'm just like for, for i guess for the both of you guys like what what is this like for you you know to 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 have seen this come together and get to a point that honestly 
I mean, it wasn't like it was never going to happen, but it, it kind of felt like when was this ever going to happen? And, and honestly, for you, Britt, like, you're getting up there a little bit. Like, right. what was sure. it? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I'm serious. Right. Like, no, no, what, no. I, I mean that genuinely. Of Like, it's cool that right. you're getting to see this. Well, people would always ask me, why? You know, you must be some kind of masochist to cover this team, you know? And I always said, I love basketball. And it doesn't matter. I'll watch a 24-win team uh, from my free spot very near the court. Uh, in NBA action. That's why I haven't missed a Wolves game in, you know, years and w wouldn't have missed a Wolves game in decades if I wasn't writing for sportsillustrated.com at the time and had deadlines on some of the games they played. But I make the home games, and occasionally I go on the road. It's because it's NBA basketball, yeah. and that is why I do it. I mean, I'll be, you know, I'm – gonna be 71 in june i call myself 71 now and uh, i'm about as confused as ant was when he was taking <laughs> the, the questions at the press conference but to love nba basketball to love the game means that it didn't matter to me if the team i was covering was bad at it but to love the game of basketball and to have what i just described in my last group of comments to you a team that invents a new trend, essentially. Yeah, that's cool. A team that adopts something out of whole cloth that um, seemed improbable. It seemed like Lori and A Rod were doing the you know typical swing and dick new owner thing. You know, we're gonna go get ourselves something. You yeah, know, we're gonna right. get the best thing on the doing planet, the Ishmael and, thing. And, you know, I mean, let's, let's and whether look. or not they had the money, you know, is now you know it's gonna be a, not a moot point. But right now. It doesn't it matter. They got the right guy. Mm -hmm. I was skeptical, especially when it began. And, you know, Tim Connolly yeah. kind of, he began to dance a little bit sometimes when you'd ask him questions early. But he came up with the goods. He, they made the Gobert trade. Both of them were in on it. They both doubled down on it. That is what is impressive to me is that these are brave executives. This is a brave coach and a brave front office guy who said no we think this is the way we're going to win and then they added to it i mean the by now like incredibly notoriously glorious delo for na and conley trade and then monte morris to get rid of it, almost addition by subtraction no no harm meant on shake milton and troy brown jr but they were only going to clog up the rotation the mm -hmm. rotation it was almost like you got an oil change after those guys left in terms of the roster. Right. So, you know, um, the point being, you asked me how I feel. I feel like a guy who loves basketball that has one of the most innovative, well-executing teams that I've been covering all year, and I get to see at least one more series that way and perhaps more. Kyle, I, I want to get I want to get to yours, but to the real quick, so I don't forget this with the executive point, and, and you were both there next to me in, in the hallway afterwards – it was in like as the players were all pouring out there and they're all going to see Finch, who somehow we've been going for 15 minutes. And I haven't <laughs> mentioned that the head coach got real, real hurt. But it was it was cool to see those executive guys kind of come to action. And they were they were pulling the players in to go do this. And it was like Dell and Tim and whatever. And and it does kind of feel like yesterday when, you know, we, we went and got beers with them and right. met them you right, know and right. they were these new and and we were like what are you what it, what is this like you traded for gobert i'm not sure like you right, know right. and and now they are in the firmament not just in the firmament but like they created this they did like right. they they they, they put and this not together. only that but it wasn't a show and tell it wasn't like hey let's have the people in to show that we're open yeah. people mm -hmm. we had some cool conversations and afterwards they would come up and dap us, hey, you know. I mean, it really was they wanted to have some kind of dialogue with the media. Now, they could snow us, which is one of the reasons I always keep myself at arm's length. But at the end of the day, the more I watch them, the more I think, and, and the conversations I do have, I think that they're – when Tim Connolly says it's about the character of the people – this is a harmonious locker room. This is a locker room where the people pull for each other. The alpha superstar, I just tweeted it out the other day, his 
generosity of spirit and the strength of his character, you couldn't ask for a better, you know, talisman for your franchise, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the guy for your franchise. Um, and everybody falls in line, you know. I mean, it just, it's nothing but good times right now, even if they were a 500 team that underperformed on their huge investment, you could still get the sense that this is a team that tried to do it a certain way and knew what they were doing right. and missed. Instead, they tried to do it a certain way, knew what they were doing, and hit. Kyle, what was that like in the hall for you? What was that like in the hall? Like what was going through your head when all the players are coming in and, and, and they're they're pumped? <clears throat> kind of like a not that this is the mountaintop or anything, but it is it is a goal accomplished, absolutely. It's the mountaintop for me. <laughs> like for real though. Uh, it's a pinch me moment. I've said this before when we've done live shows. I've said this when we've shared pods that like you've helped me get into this. I struggle with imposter syndrome. You're the reason, Britt, that I've got into writing. Uh, that 0304 team and this team are kind of married together because it's only two good real years this franchise has really ever had in 35 years. Um, but I, 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 w- I was what? 10 then I don't really know like I don't really remember what was going on then to be around this team to be at all these games to be p- a small part of all this uh we're doing this on April 28th 2024 it was April 30th 2004 the last time they advanced to the second round that was 20 years ago on you know on Tuesday yeah, KG had beef with Francisco Elson, I believe it was, of Denver. And, and, and you know, my whole thing all... <laughs> yeah, thanks. That was, <laughs> Cam, put that on TikTok. Uh, that, to me, and you know this, but, like, all season I've been tweeting about, you know, th- this team's record right, versus right. the other team, like, records of the past, and we've come a long way, friends. As a fan, first and foremost, and I embrace that, I'm just really happy for all the people in Minnesota, all the people. I mean, that arena tonight had a lot of Minnesota jerseys and ant jerseys and Nas Reed towels uh ant leaves the court after eliminating the suns to mvp chance you know on the in phoenix uh i am really really happy for people i've always said like return on investment no fan base has invested more and gotten less back Mm -hmm. on their investment their time their money their emotions and this was to me you know they still have 12 written on the whiteboard in the locker room. There's still 12 more things they want to do. Somebody drew a broom next to it, too, that kind of looked like a <laughs> dead flower. <laughs> but to me, personally, there's still more to come. This team is has a goal. They want to win a title. But to me, this was the final monkey off the back. All season, they erased so many haunting, embarrassing records, and they haven't done this, and they haven't done that. Tonight was like the final boss. Like They knocked that one out. And it's, yeah, it's not like all- about something else now, right? Yeah. Like that, like th- this was, you had to get to this point to get to whatever. What was the first words out of Tim Connolly's mouth practically during media day when he sat down and he yeah. said, well, we got to get past the first round. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the first step at least we got to, right. I mean, it was almost like, uh, you know, before we go out for lunch, we got to make the bed, you know I mean? It's like, <laughs> it, 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 I don't know if I've ever done that before lunch, <laughs> but, but I get the But it's kind out. of the same yeah. thing like Ant last year when he said, like, people were like, hey, you're a star. He's like, I'm not a star. I got to get past the first round. And right. Tim Klein's like, we got to get past the first round. Mm-hmm. So it's not over. The job is not done no, by any like, means. But it's like a new but job, right? Like it's, it's a, it evolves now it's, or something. It's Super Mario. It's a brand new level now. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, the challenge is on them. They're going to where you two will break down Denver or Lakers, Wolves all week. But, uh. This is a moment. Like this is a really sure. big fucking moment for this franchise, this organization, and to me, more importantly, like the fans. And the one of the reasons it's a moment, for me anyway, is that they're now playing with house money. Yep. I mean, this isn't they lose this series and it's same old wolves. It's, you know, great yep. regular season, but look. Yeah, do it in the know, playoffs. Go do it in the play playoffs. It off this floor again, or cat continue. You can't win with cat. A break, you know, Cat's going to get traded. Rudy's going to, you know. I mean, all the questions come out. And now it isn't, you know, there are many, many franchises. You win a first-round series, no big deal. There are some Sacramento last year would have loved to have won a first-round series. Mm-hmm. Uh, it When time is being taken, people notice. But now 
The Wolves are going to be underdogs once again, and unlike the Phoenix series, they are going to be legitimate underdogs. They are going to be playing the defending champions who are an incredibly good team that are deep, that are well-coached, and it is going to be a good series. It is not going to be a sweep, in my opinion. It is going to be a very good series with a lot of nuance, and one of the reasons is because the Wolves... As much as they want to win now for Rudy and Mike Conley and you hear it all, but they also get to play with the knowledge that they have not failed the season. Yeah. Oh, let's grab our first break. Um, today's show is brought to you by Autograph, and uh, we would love it as you're going to continue you know, consuming Wolves content uh Throughout the playoffs, you know, it's it's only kind of the, the beginning here. And if you go and download the Autograph app, that would be great for us. And I actually think it'd be great for you all as the listeners, uh, as fans, to kind of have all of your Wolf stuff um, in one place uh, to consume it. You know, whether that's this show, Brit's writing, Kyle on Flagrant Howls, John, Chris, Jay, it's it's all there um, in one place. It's, we're just, we're just uh, letting, you know, fans know that this exists um, and it's also uh, how it kind of works is as the more stuff you consume on the app there, you get points that can go towards rewards, whether that be mem- Wolves memorabilia. They're going to have different promotions throughout the playoffs for uh, different like ticket giveaways and that sort of thing. So just just download it, give it a look, uh, check it out, um, and you can unlock those rewards when you get there. So download the free autograph app in the App Store or Google Play Store today and use uh, referral code Dane Moore. Uh, that's referral code Dane Moore, and we'll see you on the app. Uh, today's show is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Uh, we've been obviously tracking Prize Picks throughout the game. The three of us were kind of sitting around before the game. Britt, what you said, you were like Durant, right? You were like, I think Durant's good. What did, what did Durant end up having? Durant, Durant, his number was was twenty five and a half. Twenty five and a half. What would what did Durant finish with? Thirty three. Uh, so you were right, Britt. Look at you. We're gonna have to promo code you. Brit for a three hundred dollar deposit. <laughs> That's right. No, I'm it's the tote master. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. And, and honestly, oh, now <laughs> you need to. You need to. We need to mute your mic during the ad reads. Um, but but in all seriousness, you know, you're gonna have like uh, it sounds like four or five days off before uh, the Denver series, or what well, we just call it the Denver series before before that ends up. Uh, coming you know coming to fruition and i think many of you who are listening are going to you know be checking out the the rest of these nba games even though the wolves aren't playing and it's just fun to you know if you know you're going to be watching a game uh take a look at at what the over on the more or less stands are and and submit a daily fantasy lineup it's just a fun way to have something else going on a game um again it doesn't need to be something that breaks the bank or anything like that but it's just a fun way to play daily fantasy so as always that's prizepicks.com or the Prize Picks app promo code Dane for a one hundred dollar sign up bonus. We should probably talk about Ant more, um, and and Cat like like really. I mean, in in, in the way that that Cat del- delivered to tonight, particularly, and we can get a little bit into the game of of the ways in which um, tonight's matchup needed Cat more. But but the place to start is with Ant. The three of us on multiple different podcasts, episodes, you know, in the last couple of weeks, and even kind of going back into the season, we've been talking about this idea with Ant of like, what what is he going, how is he going to level up? Will he level up as a playmaker? We know the kid in in single coverage and even against a really good defender is a problem, right? He's He just, he is a problem there, but... I think for anybody, like, I, I'd be curious in, like, an outsider perspective, like a national media person, if you really watched all four of these games, it, how much it changed your view of Ant. Because for me, Anthony Edwards is is now on a different level in, in my mind. And he was already on a, a high level and ascending, but he broke this. He broke what they did so well against him during the regular season and what he's had problems with throughout his career with two on the ball and pressure and all those things. And I mean, I've said it after every single game, but the diligence to stay with that and, and not be tempted to try and take over. He didn't, 
he didn't force taking over at any point in the series, yet still took over like three games and and won them. It's it's <clears throat> excuse me, it's the story of the series. It's the story of the series, but it's also it's a big story. Like this this is this is big in and now Ant is he's on a he's on a different level in in my book now. Wanna take that, Britt? Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I got to like practice my hosting. I got to like tee up. <laughs> well, no, you don't, you don't have to. I'll, I'll kick it to Britt, but I will say, because I asked Anne after the game, I said this in the first segment, but you could tell when I was on the court taking video that he was su- like, he gets a lot of MVP chance at Target Center, and rightfully so, because he's really good. But when you start getting MVP chance on the road, when you start getting MVP chance in the building of the team that you just eliminated and sent to possibly play in purgatory for a while um he's 22 years old rudy said it the other night he's like this kid next to me is 22 feel free to open up your beer into the microphone that's what kyle does (laughs) oh that pick up no there you go (laughs) brett too late you can't Uh, it's open again i'm gonna lob this to brett because he he is the historian of all this and has covered the team but he's 22 years old he is becoming truly carl said the, the he's the face of the league like he has all the persona all the charisma all the stuff that goes into building a culture tonight he hits 40 points breaks you know more 30 point games in the playoffs than kevin garnett and he's 22 this team's only had this franchise has only had two really super duper potential face of the league guys and at 22 years old he's already just shattering all these kevin garnett records the guy I drew up grew up with posters and all that stuff it's just to brits or to dane's point like it is like this is this is different now like he is in that hemisphere of the best of the best in the league. Well, as recently as um, I did a season review before I did a playoff preview. What was that? Less than two weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago. I yeah, can't the, the well, last it's, two it's weeks two, have been such yeah, a war. Yeah, the regular season ended on the 14th. <laughs> that was two weeks from today or two weeks ago today. I was saying Ant still has things that he does. You know, he still is inattentive on defense sometimes. He's still – off ball, you know, he doesn't have peripheral vision. He still takes plays off. Um, and I wound up saying, you know, it doesn't matter relative to his greater growth. But those things were still, you could nitpick. Mm-hmm. And they were legitimate nitpicks. Um, Not many in this series. What I am None. noticing is this guy knows where the money is when it comes to being where to put your energy and how to put your energy. Mm -hmm. He knows when is the right time to... I asked Rudy what was the most impressive thing about the defense in the first two games. It was after game two when we just arrived in Phoenix. And he said, greater awareness and getting back on defense. And I immediately knew he was mostly talking about Ant. Because those are the two things. Ant's awareness comes and goes. And Ant's getting back on defense comes and goes. And the fact that Rudy said that was almost solely, I think, because Ant was doing it so well. There isn't a question. Ty Lue, I mean, I still can't believe he said this, but I listened to it three times. Ty Lue called him the best on-ball defender he's ever seen, and it was because of the tryouts in the U.S. Olympics yeah. where Ant announced he was going to be the alpha and then basically was the alpha because he was shutting down people one-on-one on defense. And we saw we saw it against Paul George in one of that Clipper games where he turned him around. We saw it against John ja Morant. We've seen him do it to just about anybody when Ant has a mind to and he has the challenge. The p- the issue with Ann, I won't say problem, because he is 22, and you have to give him that wide berth. Yeah, yeah. You have to that, say, yeah. but the issue always was, can he sustain the focus? Can he fill in the cracks? Can he be Kawhi Leonard-like on defense, but also Drew Holiday-like in terms of consistency? And I'm not saying he's the equivalent of Kawhi versus Drew or equal to Drew. What I'm saying is, is that Ant always had a ceiling, but he also had a pretty, pretty low floor. And what has been impressive about these playoffs is the floor is raised. 
Hmm. I don't ever worry about the ceiling with that because he keeps breaking new plaster up there. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, the floor can sometimes drop out. Right. And you go, whoa. You know, Ant didn't tag that guy. Ant didn't do this. Ant, you know, mm -hmm. Ant missed that backdoor cut. You know, we never said that in these no. playoffs. Um, meanwhile, he's taking on double teams, trying to dribble through them to make sure that they remain legitimate double teams because if you don't, have you ever noticed that Ant doesn't immediately get off the ball? He probes. Mm-hmm. And what that does is that keeps those two defenders in place. And it also alerts the guys around them that they may have to cheat. And that's when those skip passes, and that's when those weak side cuts, those are the times when those dimes get even more open. And he is doing the little things. The guy is already a high-end superstar because he does the big things in a really flashy way. And all of a sudden, the guy who is a flashy, charismatic superstar is cocking things, is filling in gaps, and is playing in a way that draws the admiration of Rudy Gobert, who's Mr. Perfection on defense. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think we're going to see this level of defense from him the regular season on a regular basis. But I think now we know when the stakes are high, Ant's coming to the table with all his skills and awareness intact. It's very like you. All, I don't know. This came to my mind, but it, you you used to make or the the Paul George comparison for Ant. It's yeah. very like Indiana Paul George. What he's doing, but with high, like with room above that. Yeah, Paul to, George to didn't posterize people. The way Ant does. I yeah. mean, I mean, the thing about Ant is that the thing that people love about Kobe, and I'm not a Kobe guy. I'll, I'll come right out and say it. But what people love about Kobe is that he was an incredible star with incredible athleticism, but also was somebody who had this enormous amount of want to win and dedication to the game. And what Ann has is a drive to win and a dedication to the game that is coming up now. I mean, we're seeing, when you, you talk about the leap, what you're talking about, in my view, is what ways can you shorten your chances of collapse what ways can you heighten your ways of coming through and Ants had some really good people Finch Conley to begin with those are the two I would say at the top and you asked an excellent question by the way when you had Ant describe his relationship with Finch and folks should go look for that I'm sure it's online somewhere but what Ant is doing now the leap you're saying is that the guy has a very, very high floor, and to have a high floor like that and have an enormous ceiling like that at the age of 22, um, he hasn't even started his contract, has he? No, <laughs> that's next year. I remember, I remember uh, you like and I talking in the summertime about how important you thought the World Cup was going to be for Ant. And I was kind of like, ah, you know, like it, it's like it's not really the stars, you know. It's like Paulo Bencaro and Brandon Ingram or whatever. Like, and I, you were right, and 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 Mike Nori, who again did the press the press conference with us because because again the coach <laughs> Nori, <laughs> yeah, Patella. People uh. will know by now that Chris Finch ruptured a patella tendon in his what, what knee was it? Anyway. Probably his right knee. Yeah. Breaking right news from Burt Robson. And it's going to be, <laughs> and it's going to be, you know, uh, in pain for a long time, and and maybe on the sidelines, but maybe yeah. not. Well, we'll see. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. Um, but but I thought it was interesting, Kyle, that uh, that Mike Nori referenced to the playmaking point that that that's kind of where it started leveling up was with the World Cup play. And I, I, I think that was like a – Mike Conley's been planting the seeds, right? He's been, yeah. he's been planting the seeds. I asked Mike about that in the locker room after of like 
how much of a goal was this? Of, or I, I asked him, when did you make this your goal? Because it's obvious Mike's intention for quite some time has been to get Ant to be this. The things we're talking about, the, the playmaking, the Absolutely. smarts, uh, the thinking Absolutely. of the game. And, and, and what Mike said was like about two weeks after I got here um, last season, you know, of kind of seeing that, which is also like what he was seeing was, oh, this guy can be a point guard, which is it, that in and of itself is a selfless right. thing of getting right. traded, getting traded and being like, I actually, I'm the point guard, but I want you to do it. I just think Kyle, the way it, the people he's had, I mean, and at the end of the day, it's, it's Ant has taken this and learned it and done it and executed it. But the people that have been around him, I think, have have shaped this. Like, I don't think Ant could have done the, done it on his own. The influence that he's had from the coaching staff to Mike Conley, to experiences like the World Cup last year, it's just molded him well. You know, like I the ideal way. He's like in his senior season, right, of the NBA, year four. And we've talked about this before, but there's probably no better guy to play alongside in the backcourt your rookie year, COVID, all that weird stuff, just learning what the NBA is than Ricky Rubio. And then year two, like, we need you to be a little more of a dog. Like, you got to play a little defense. And it's got Pat Bev, right? And then, like, third year, whatever you want to say about D'Lo, it's like some shot making, some big time stuff. And then fourth year, senior year, grad school, whatever, it's like, is there a better player in the league to play alongside to mentor you than, than Mike Conley? Uh, and to me, the cool thing about the playmaking and the Team USA stuff, they won this series because he became a playmaker. But they won this game, back to Britt's point, because he kind of went a little Kobe. In that first half, you asked him this, like, he tried the playmaking thing. Let me kick it, let me kick it, let me make the right play. And out Carl was three for three from three. Mm -hmm. The rest of his teammates were one for 15 from three. So you know what he said? Fuck it. Third quarter, 15 points. Right. Fourth quarter, 16 points. And he just went, I mean, basketball, the way basketball should be played, and you've kind of taught me this, is like team basketball. That's what's different between the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Phoenix Suns. One team play, plays team basketball, despite what Devin Booker said that one year. The other team plays ISO basketball. But when they need, the NBA is still making big shots. And to me, to kind of put it all in one, I thought it was really cool. The last recorded stat of the game was Ant blocking Booker mm. and then just talking so much shit to him, right? Because go back to this full circle, Team USA, there's your starting two guard for mm. the Olympics. Mm. Juicy. And when Ant was asked, how did it feel to, uh, you know, go up against, you know, guys who, you know, you admired and so on and so forth, like KD and Booker and so on and so forth. Well, KD for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did do that. But we, but we talk, and I'm curious for Britt's take, but like we talked about this after game three. All throughout the season when it got really hairy late in the fourth mm. and Finch wanted to slow it down, especially after a made bucket by the opponent, they'd inbound it to Mike because Mike would calm them down. Mm -hmm. Game three, fourth quarter, when it got a little hairy and they were kind of coming back, they played a Kogi or whatever, every possession they inbounded it to Ant. And he said, Ant, bring it up. We'll all get out of the way. You initiate the offense. And again, tonight, that was the same thing. It's like, it's your time now. It's, it's point, Ant. Like, you you bring it up. It's all on you. You find the right play. You navigate the coverage. And, I mean, come on, man. 31 points in the second half in a closeout game. To do something this team hasn't done in 20 years, that's, to your point, leveling up. Well, you know what I loved about your analogy? And, by the way, I mean, Kyle is incredibly humble. But I've shared a microphone with him on numerous occasions now and he knows the game really really well and uh, uh basically tries to peter fock his way through but uh, essentially you know oh, to what look do you that mean up. by that what do you you know i mean like i'm just a little that's what i'm thinking detective. about your analogy right now <laughs> trying to figure out the case you know no yeah. no uh, peter yes fock, probably yes. 1970s detective reference there but uh, <laughs> kyle is self-deprecating right uh, but when he talked about Conley as the graduate or thesis teacher, whatever you want to do, you don't want Mike Conley teaching you at the elementary level. Mike Conley teaches you when you've had the Rubio course, when yeah, you've had yeah. the Pat Bev course, when you've had the D'Lo course. Then you're ready for Mike Conley, and Mike Conley sees that you're ready, and he gives you his bottomless wisdom. And what is... So heartwarming, 
One of the most heartwarming things about these last year and a half and why I'm suddenly a huge Tim Conley fan is because Ant adores Mike Conley. Mike Conley is trusted every time Mike Conley opens his mouth. I mean... Did you guys see that little, like, Ant Mike Conley little hug thing as as time was going up? Yeah. yeah. I mean... There's a relationship there that is really special, and it's because he's a 22-year-old kid who isn't who who plays the high-end, outwardly shallow media game, but also plays. To go back to your room, look at some film, talk to your 16-year veteran in the locker room game, and is like a sponge. I mean, one of the things Chris Finch said in his little rant when the guy said, you haven't won in 30 years, and he said, I don't give a fuck, I wasn't here for most of it, was they're a young team, I coach them hard. Again, all of this is like, a, what they mean is Ant is young, and I coach them hard. I mean, yeah, I, Jade McDaniels, Nas Reed, yeah. But he doesn't coach Jade McDaniels and Nas Reed the way he coaches Ant. You can tell when he talks about Ant, Anthony, as he always says. Yeah. I love the little, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's a good one. <laughs> but he knows that guy's special. And uh, he coaches him hard because he recognizes that Ant is going to take it. It's, you know, the whole, I mean, the, the most frequent cited example is pop and tim duncan Mm. and you have this thing where you you rant on your best player and your best player takes it and it's kind of like if you've got siblings in the family and your parent is telling your older sibling what's right and what's wrong you're learning what not to do and what to do without having it come down on you at all Mm -hmm. and Jade McDaniels and Nas Reed and, you know, people are hearing the way he coaches Ant, and they have the benefit of not being under the microscope when they hear those lessons. Yeah, the Duncan pop, that's a that's yeah. that's the right comp. Yeah. You, you know what else is cool for me? You guys go to all these home games, you watch all these games just like everyone else listening to this. Those first couple of years with Ant, like a shoelace would come untied and he'd sub out, right? Like any sort of random little bump and stuff he'd look yeah, like they, he would just walk off the court yeah, that was like three months ago <laughs> right, you know what I mean? like, but it was just like a little random intrigue oh my god did ant like just pull a finch and blow up his patella and it's like actually right. nope he's fine and he'll sub back in but like right. those weird moments that was a thing there was a dozen times where three and a half years ant would i call it mike millering <laughs> yeah mike Miller, because he used to like look like he was dead on the sideline and then get back in in two plays and it but then tonight there was two different times he his knee. Yeah. where he wrecked an ankle, had to switch shoes, got mm. hit in the eye, and it was never even a thought to like look at the bench or be like, "Hey, sub me out" or whatever. He doesn't usually look at that. He just goes to the locker room. <laughs> but and, but it was just <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah. But at one of the threes in the fourth. I mean, that mentality, that change, that evolution, that maturity. I mean, you said it late in the fourth when he hit a shot. It's just like he's a killer. And he said it to SVP on after mm-hmm. game three. He's just like, I want to kill everything in front of me. But that is like the final spice in the recipe of, I don't know if you can develop that or if you are born with that, but he has it. And that's what makes this kid and this team and now this organization really special. I think you are born with it. I really do. I, I've I do seen too. a lot of basketball players and there are players who hit big shots and there are players who hit the amount of big shots a normal human being would hit. Um, there are just guys who get better. Jamal Murray is one. Yeah, Jamal yeah. Murray is a better player in the playoffs than he is outside the playoffs. Anthony Edwards, I've seen him now in three playoff series. He's been much, much better every single series than he was during the regular season. He's just... he. He rises to the occasion. I factored into anything I think about the Wolves' postseason chances. I started doing that last year, you know, and I'm really going to do it for this Denver series. I got to think long and hard about this Denver series because they have Ant. Mm-hmm. To the, you mentioned this like five minutes back, Kyle. The 
the we play team basketball thing i guess maybe just contextualize that that was those was two years ago is that target center devin booker yelled at the wolves bench and this is you know iterations ago Chris Paul, of, Bridges, Suns, but, yeah. well that's what i was gonna say you know why that Suns team played team basketball because they had a fucking point guard it was chris paul and you know why this team why the timberwolves play team basketball because they have mike conley and this group needs it because if the wolves didn't have mike conley it would devolve into isolation and a lot of these players would be on the wolves would become redundant in ways in in many ways like phoenix was cripplingly right. redundant now you know and having mike not just as the visionary and the professor with the tweed jacket and all that that was actually really good um but they have a point guard too and and that fosters this all it, that i think that's what allows like the shape shifting sort of thing to happen with this group is like you have these because we're, we're focusing on Ant and Cap, but you have these like two tent poles in Mike and Rudy that are almost like bumpers in bowling or something like that, yeah. that, that, that just kind of keep you moving generally in, in the right direction always. And that's like, if I had to describe this season as a whole, that's what it was. It was it was never losing three games in a row, right? Right. It was, it was, it, it always moved in the right direction, not linearly, but like it kept going up. The, the, the whole time and that is because of the people around Ant and Cat. But let's get into Cat a little bit because because it was the best game of his career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah I mean, Dead serious. I mean, there's not a lot of pressure on the Wolves in an elimination game. I mean, you can go back home, win in five, whatever. Although, again, I keep coming back to the fact that we heard so much about how much they enjoyed that week off and how it allowed them to do football drills and get guys in really good shape and add some spice to the to the recipe or whatever. Uh, 28 points, 10 rebounds, 11 for 17 from the field, 4 for 6 from 3. Zero turnovers. Mm-hmm. Zero turnovers. It was in the biggest moment of his career, a career that has had a lot of statistical success, but what, year 8, year 9? He's never made it out of the first round? True. He was... And again, I said 15 points in the third for Ant, 16 points in the fourth. They needed Carl cooking early, and I thought Carl cooked a little early. Again, foul trouble tonight with five, but I thought it was not one too of, late. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was Carl's most impactful game of the series, and I thought it was Carl's best, most meaningful, do it in the playoff type bullshit game of his career. Yeah, Britt, the, I mean, to this game specifically, it required Cat right because yes. because. Two big things happened. Uh, this game was nothing like the first three games. I thought just from a no, nope. this from was a, a game where the, where the Timberwolves should have lost. Yep. Yes, yep. but they they didn't because the two things that changed were Rudy Gobert was in perpetual foul trouble, and the Suns were perpetually playing small. And I I've been saying every every episode I thought that was a gear that they the Suns should have been getting into more often. And I think that proved accurate in this game. And the Wolves, when they went to it in games one through three, wasn't perfect the the way they handled it. And what happened in this one was Carl stepped up in those minutes against those lineups, handled he shape shifted, mm-hmm. you know, and in into a a role that swelled and changed. And Ant kind of hijacked my question to to Cat when I asked him about it. But it, the the analogy I thought of was like. Carl just kind of ha- like it was boxing, you know, throughout through this, where it was like, you know, I'm not, I don't have the chance to take a lot of big swings right. here. He did it. His role was specifically actually don't do he that. He said that after game three. Mm-hmm. He literally said, and uh, this actually is going to be a theme of my column when I write it probably in a few hours. But essentially, what I love about this Wolves team is that they cop to learning. They cop the vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Um, Kat said, uh, Nas Reed showed me how to play my position, and I am going to play that way now that I'm back. I mean, that's what somebody, it might even be you, that asked him what, you know, 
Yeah, I did. What did. In fact, it was you. You said, what did you and Finch talk about? You said, Finch said he was going to have something specific to talk to you about. And he said, to sacrifice myself. And then he mentioned two or three things Nas did that were dead on, mm -hmm. that Nas did do, that did help the team. And the fact is, this nine-year veteran who was the face of the franchise, Gerson Rosas, probably wanted to put a statue outside on him and basically run the franchise by him. I mean, he hired Ryan Saunders because Ryan Saunders was the biggest cat bobo there was. I mean, it was all about cat all the time. And now it's not. It's about Ant. It's about Rudy. And then it's about Cat. Yep. And so he's taking third place. He's shifted position. It's not a great position for him. He did get burned a bunch on defense tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but I think either Jace or I, somebody mentioned it to Conley, and Conley said, well, you got to score some points too. Yeah. yeah. And he's exactly right. And in that first half, if Cat wasn't shooting well from deep, then Phoenix is up by 12 rather than 5. Oh, yeah, it's an L. Half. Like yeah. they, they, and all yeah. of a sudden, it's like, hey, you know, we're going to win this game. And when Phoenix thinks it's going to win a game, that's the thing about Phoenix. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're shiny, but they're thin. And so... If the, you know, they're front runners, and if they're up by a dozen, they're going to play really, really well. And so Cat prevented them from front running. Cat kept it a game. That's and well that put. is why I would think. Um, I'm not sure I agree with you, but I'll have to think about it because there's not a tremendous amount of competition <laughs> right. for Cat's greatest game ever because, let's face it, he's been here nine years, haven't been a lot of big games. But He did it I'd against a good team. He did, this was a good team that they played against tonight. And he did it. And if you do want to poke holes in the 57 or the 62 or whatever, right. it's because it was against Charlotte right, and right. who You're the right. hell was guarding him and all that. Right, like, right, right. this was, I mean, th to me, this was on so many levels above the 62 point game. Oh, yeah. I would agree with that totally. Yeah. Like, I'm just trying to think of, you know. But did anyone need to win a playoff series on this team more than him? Well, because um, he kind of copped to that after the game, right? Like, here's, this here's what I would say to that. I don't know if Tim Conley and Chris Finch have the belief in Cat that they say they do. But what I do know is when I've been skeptical of things they've said, because I think that maybe they're varnishing it a little bit, they haven't been. So I'm going to take them at their word this time. And if I'm taking them at their word this time, I'm going to say that Cat isn't on the block. I mean, ownership may have more to do with that than they do. And that's a whole seven, five other podcasts. But essentially, I think at this point in time, Tim Connolly and Chris Finch are vested in Cat. And I think that's one of the reasons he has been kind of the mensch he's been. But in answer to the Wolves media or fan base and media, um, it's a skeptical group. Cat is always in prove it mode, and he always partially proves it. And so he the debate continues. And he wants to, for those people to, like, yeah. he is, I mean, I we, we talk about this a lot, Britt, like, the one time that Finch described Cat as a pleaser by nature, you know, and that's a quote. It's like, the only uh, time he said it, too. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it is. He went it, back to his room and he said, I'm not saying that again. <laughs> but, but it is. It, it's like, accurate. That's the thing. I, I'm saying even in this series it was. Yeah. Because there was not, like, another pathway to play cat in this series, right? It was just a tricky matchup. And if you want to look for an evidence point of why it was a tricky matchup for a five to be playing the four, look at Nas Reed, not a great series. You know what I'm Absolutely. saying? Like the, great first game. This, this was, he had, they asked him to do the job and he, he agreed to abide by that and, and roll with that role. 
you know, and they gave him his bona fides for it was you get KD, you know, and like that's it is a big job and was a big job. It was the right thing to to do with Cat, and that was a big thing we we all talked about before of like how are you going to handle this this KD matchup? How are you going to handle Cat in this? You have four scores. You have two big men. Yes, something is going to be amiss. Mm-hmm. You have to patch a seam. How are you going to patch that seam? And and, and Nikhil Alexander Walker was one of the ways, but the, that wasn't. But for, you, you can't do that for forty eight. You have to throw Cat. Cat is like part of the you know to mix metaphors. Part of the darning process. Part of the you know, you have to weave in some, you have to, to stuff the breach with some kind of material. And Cat was the stuffer. Um, and so it's not a glamorous job to guard Kevin Garnett when you're... Durant. You have, yeah. you, you, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, Give him a water. Oh, my first one of the year. <laughs> uh, To guard Kevin Durant. A wordsmith by nature. <laughs> when you have, like, size 22 feet. Hard. Very, very hard. You go put on a pair of clown shoes and try to guard Kevin Garnett. <laughs> you know, it just isn't going to happen very easily. And he did fine. I mean, again, it was the right matchup. He survived enough to be able to get points. It's the right matchup because, and I've said this before, the gap between K. KD being guarded by Cat and KD being guarded by Slow Mo or Nas or some other option. Mm-hmm. You know, Ant took it for a while. That um, didn't work. The gap is not that great. And then you also have Cat's matchup problem for Phoenix, mm-hmm. which manifested itself tonight. And when was the last time you heard Cat speak like a smart veteran? I mean, after game three. He said, I have to pick my spots, which is how yeah. you picked up your question. Mm-hmm. Some games will be there for me. Some games it won't. It was obviously there for him tonight. They were really determined to keep Ant from scoring. He scored one field goal, I think, maybe, and maybe two by halftime. He didn't have a field goal in the, until like the first seven minutes. Uh, they really were interested in clamping him down. And, of course, Ant being Ant gave Remember him all kinds of credit for that. Remember how he got his first bucket of the third quarter or of the second half? Ant or Cat? Ant. When when Cat got the offensive rebound and fed him it in off the corner. Ant. And that that got his rhythm going. That was the first three of the thirty one, right, Kyle? Yep. Yep. Right? Like I, I mean I remember I clip I was that, like, I'm gonna go clip a, this and put this out no, there. Man, but that was a J Mac like loose ball mm-hmm. that Cat got off. He crashed the from the left corner. Carum to the it. middle, out by the foul line, and zipped the pass to the right corner for Ant, and boom. Mm-hmm. And then the rest was twenty-eight points for. So that. yeah, I mean, you know, it's um, Cat deserves his flowers, and if we're going to criticize Cat, and I've done more than my share, um, because we perceive things about him that are weak then we have to acknowledge that he has to overcome those weaknesses to turn in a unexpectedly good performance or a better-than-expected performance. That means that all the things we're looking sideways at him about are being taken care of to make this a net positive. The reason I thought it was such a great series, a lot of A's in the grades, is because one of my favorite pods all season was when you guys did a nine-hour trilogy on the cat integration when he was coming back, and you got pretty heated, and you thought, you know, what's going to happen in moments where, like... Yeah, and I said we shouldn't play in the first round. Yeah, you wanted him to run <laughs> high pick and roll with Leonard Miller in garbage time. But, no, uh, I just, you know... Four, game th- four or five pick and roll. G- game three was cool because, and we talked about this after, th- after that game, Finch said, you, you know, they're going small. This is not for you. We're pulling you. Mm-hmm. And he just, he, you know, politics aside, contract aside, he pulled them. And after the game, Carl's like, yeah, that was perfect. Like, it was the right move. And then in tonight. It was weird they, he was the answer then tonight against small ball. I know, it was. But, I mean, it, tonight when they needed him. So, maybe. He li- stepped up. That's a little hyperbole of the best game ever. But there's no way you're going to poke holes anyone in the fact that it was the most valuable game Carl Anthony Towns has ever played. Yes. Because it was the biggest spot. And to me, 
I think Ant could have lost a playoff series to his idol and gotten a little heat and been fine. But at some point, Carl Anthony Towns had to win a playoff series. He's mm-hmm. nine years in the league, and he finally got that monkey off his back. You could tell that he got that monkey off his back tonight. He talked about it, but... Good for uh, him, man. Yeah. Good for him. It's like, I'm, I'm sure you guys get this, like, with, with your friends, too. Like, that that always, for me, that always comes up. Like, oh, what you know, like, what's Cat like? And, and, a, and right. a lot of people find him to be frustrated. And I'm always like, what I always say first is I'm like, he's the best dude. Because he, I mean, he's just like a genuinely nice person. And then sometimes the retort to that from the person is like, well, that's why he's bad. You know, (laughs) and it and and what we were talking about earlier with with like Ant leveling up and changing and showing something he hasn't before. I think Cat did that too in in this series. And I don't know if leveling up is what I would call it for Cat, but it would be like taking on a new form and deciding to deliver in that way so as to level up the group. We talked about that on Friday too of like, but what I said is like, I'm not sure. I can really point to one player ever in Carl's career that it's like Carl really elevated that player that season, you know, outside of the general just help he gives from being a really effective, efficient offensive player. That's the change I see with Carl here in this is he helped his teammates. He, and, and consistently throughout all, all of the ant flurries were almost always, on the tail end of a Carl Flurry throughout the right. whole series. And that, given how we know that Phoenix was guarding them and loaded up on it, I mean, as Ant said in his post-game press conference, he goes, well, yeah, in the second half, they stopped. Stop guarding they st- doubling they stopped, me. They stopped doubling me. They you know why they him. did that? They get on him. Because a cat. Right, we, ta- right, we called right, that. Right. I'm just going to say we called right. that. That was that is That had to happen for Ant to be able to have a 30-point half, a, even a 20-point right. half. Like, Carl has to go. That's just against that coverage and that defense. Carl had to go to get Ant to go. It just it, it it had to happen in this series, and it did. And 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 Carl, yeah, he he deserves credit for that. I think it's worth mentioning. Ninety minutes in, just look at the box score, because Tim Tim Conley referenced after the game too. Phoenix played really well. That was the best game they've played in the series, in my opinion. Devin Booker had forty nine points on sixty two percent shooting. Him and KD combined for eighty two points. Like. The Suns did go down swinging, and the Wolves still found ways to whatever they had to do. Carl Ant, uh, I'd like to give a quick shout-out to Jane McDaniels, who hit really big shots, 18 points. Like He was kind of the third banana tonight for were, them. Were you in his scrum? Were either of you guys in his scrum? Just I was Jason, Jason. It was just me, no, it was me, Britt, and Jace, and Britt just had some bangers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I literally, Jace was like, told me Jaden was... Or maybe you did. Just but the three of what us. happened? What happened? I, I don't know. Well, essentially, I mean, I, <laughs> if you're going to ask anybody about, like, things that get said on the side and Jaden has just won something, he's the perfect guy to ask. I mean, very rarely is Jaden McDaniels a good interview. Let me say that first off. Because he's keeps things to the close to the vest. He's one of those guys. He's a he's a terse he's a quiet interview. dude. I, yeah. He's a terse interview. But I said now that the series is over, um, nobody wanted to say you know. This is what really you know. Did you feel like in the third quarters in the second half that you were grinding down the the Suns? It was an obvious thing to watch. Anybody who really paid attention to the series saw the talented veteran slightly past their prime in two of the three cases, Phoenix Suns being ground down by the greater depth and greater defense and greater physicality of the Wolves and youth, physicality, and defense is Jade McDaniel's three calling cards. Mm -hmm. So what better person to ask, were they being ground down? (laughs) What and he, he said they were crying about it in game one. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect. And then he, I will say there was more questions. And at the end, Britt kind of put a book into it. He goes, did you ever feel like they, they, you know, kind of ground you guys down a little bit? And Jane just goes, no, sir. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> the senior oh. discount on that one. I think that's where the sir came from. Well, I mean, should we, should we talk about Nas's comments about your fit Oh, yeah, today? I think we should. 
Because what? I, you know what was the kicker on that is I have no idea what he was talking about. Everybody's kind of looking at me and smiling, you know. So, and I'm going, why? Why are they smiling at me that way? Take us so post game we go into the locker room. There's a lot, dozens of people in there with big cameras, and we're just getting bodied by everyone. So that's why me and Britt kind of went over, hung out by Jaden. But we walk in. Britt's in a very festive, cool button up. <laughs> Is that why? I thought it was my uh, John Lennon hat. It was the hat, <laughs> the it was jeans, the, combo. the, the K-Swiss. Whole, the, if we're going to do the NBA, like the fit that Britt Robson had on. It's color game coordinated, four, man. League you got to say, I have only one fashion move, and that is to coordinate my colors. And he walks into the locker room and Nas is in stall two. <laughs> <laughs> and Nas just goes loud. He goes, oh, my guy came to eight to AZ ready. <laughs> just looks at Brit's outfit and it was so good <sighs> but I, I still I'm, don't know what that means what does you the AZ ha- ready mean Arizona you came to Arizona with a oh, good outfit oh, oh okay all right yeah I will yeah. say though back to oh, Jane we put this together on <laughs> <laughs> well I mean first of all everybody is like laughing and I know they're laughing at my expense and I don't mind being laughed at my expense it wasn't at your expense he was well, well a little bit I mean? maybe a little well, bit I mean, <laughs> if it wasn't for the me showing up that way it wouldn't have been a good joke but essentially I mean I don't mind that's my point is I don't mind being laughed at at my expense but it's always good to be in on the joke <laughs> yeah. well now you are two hours later <laughs> All these people laughing at him going, oh, AZ, uh, it must be uh, something like uh, hit pyong lingo that the kids are using now. Uh, AZ, I wonder, you know, because I knew a rapper named AZ, but that was way before. I Nada's can't believe time. that's where your head went <laughs> when he said AZ was. T- Brit- AZ actually is one of my favorite rapper rappers of old. But. Britt Robson and Nas Reed had the two best post-game outfits on. Go look at what the, the shirt that Nas had. Did you see this? Uh-oh, what does it say? What does it say? It, the back of his element what? shirt. It's the definition of the F word. Yeah, it's. Uh, I tweeted it out. But the, the Jaden thing was cool because it was like. The did meet. you ask him to take that? Or did yeah, you no, just he, take he's that? like, take a picture of this. So I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> so I tweeted it out. Um, but, you know, Mike does post game media in the locker room and there's a giant scrum and Rudy does one, right? And it was just me, Jason, Britt. But the actual thing I like and the reason I like Jaden all these years and when I watched him play a little bit in the Pac 12 is that this is going to sound so nerdy, but the NBA has just become so everyone loves everyone. You know, and the reason I love the playoffs for a multitude of reasons, I like the playoffs because you're on the biggest stage and you're under a microscope. And when thing like you, everyone knows why the suns don't work now. And that's all we're going to talk about for six months. Like you're under this big microscope and all this stuff. But I also, I kind of like, I grew up in the days, Brit, where not everyone liked everyone. Exactly. <laughs> like, I don't like everyone exactly. I work with. I don't always like everyone in my family. I don't always like everyone in my hometown. And Brit pulled it out of him. And there were some other really cool quotes. Jaden McDaniels doesn't like those guys. Yeah. Jaden McDaniels, I'm not breaking He does not like Devin Booker at all. He and doesn't he, like Jamal Murray either, which and, is going to be really yeah. interesting. Mm-hmm. But he even said sometimes, like, I don't really want to get into it or whatever. And Jason's like, we're not going to play those guys again until next year. And Jaden's like, I'm not worried about playing them next year either. <laughs> Like he, do you he, remember? Were, were you there when uh, they lost to the Kings? And it was like the, I don't know. The, 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 how many times are the Kings? The, it was like the first team that had beaten the Wolves multiple times. And right, so, right, right. so somebody's asking him about that. And are you worried about the Kings? Are, are, are you are you worried about the Kings? Are the only team has beat you multiple times? He goes, No, I think we'd sweep them if we yeah. played them in the playoffs. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's literally directly no, word no, for word. But he goes, well, very no, he goes. I think though. we beat him in four games. Right, 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 right. 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 But he also it, talked about two to you and to Jace, like maybe you asked him the question. And you were there too, man. No, but no, but but no, I was just it's in the moment. Paul, Paul, he goes, Paul deprecation, self deprecation. Seventy. We gotta really work on him. Paul Bleaker, Blart, Paul Blart. What Paul was the guy's Blart. name? <laughs> Paul Blart, Malcolm. Walmart, um, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> the guy from um, uh, the the. The no, I'm talking about your the, joke, the your 1970s dude. random reference, not oh. Scientology. <laughs> your your joke from 10 minutes ago. I'm talking about that, Paul Fluger or whatever. Okay, no, back but, to Paul. Know, Britt, Britt asked him. He goes, "When you have a defensive guy like on a team, like that's a big deal. But you have three of them. Fuck, <laughs> Paul. You, that's where I got confused. How, how important is it to have essentially at times three Jadens?" Right, like right. three yeah, guys that when, exponentially when right. Devin Booker is has Jaden on him and gets a switch, now it's Nikhil. It's like that's gotta suck. Mm-hmm. Right? Then it's like, Ant, then it's slow mo. Right, and then I get past all of them, and, and then it's, it's Rudy, four time defensive player of the year. Right, 
Like that's got to be, dude. I, I I think the I think Phoenix could have pulled an upset against a different team. Like oh, that that sure. didn't like didn't have that. For like I don't sure. want to necessarily like put that on the Thunder, but like I think at the Suns. I, I don't personally Couldn't leave this been, series. Uh, at the three best teams in the West. It may, not have, them. Have shown, but, they, but, but, but you're right. They might have had a shot against the Clippers or Mass. That's what I'm saying. Right? Absolutely. Like, this wasn't... I don't take this series as a, like, Phoenix was just, like, a dead-in-the-water team and dead-on arrival because they put this roster together, all that. Like, Phoenix came in as, like, a team... They were favored. They were favored... By they Vegas. Were and but, and the Wolves. But they had some that of that out. celeb stuff too, you know what I mean? For sure. As do the as do the Mavs and Clippers. <laughs> so that's why the, that might have been might have been a good matchup. Um is there any other thing we, like from this that we want to make sure we hit on before we, we wrap it? Anything Well one I, I wanted to get back to Cat for just a second. Yeah. Because I formed a a fairly bedrock opinion about Cat, which is that Cat is going to make you look bad if you support him, and Cat is going to make you look bad if you rip him. Mm. He is the kind of player that weather veins his productivity at both ends of the court. It's a higher level on offense, but consequently... He has become like the lazy analyst weather vane, he, or the lazy analyst uh, lightning rod, I should say. Uh, somebody says, well, cat, you know, you can't win with cat, or trade cat, right. or cats. People are besmirching cat. He's the best guy on the team, and you, you, people are always ripping him. They're unfair to him. Everything you want to say about cat contains a little bit of truth. Mm. And... What you need to do is accept the fact that Cat is a flawed, talented NBA star. He is going to get max money where he goes, and he is going to become known as a great player going down the line in terms of what he's done. He's a he's a career 600 true shooting percentage guy. And he has issues with various aspects of his game. If you rip cat, you better have a lot of caveats to it, like mm-hmm. what he does X, Y, and Z. Right. And if you praise cat, you better have a lot of caveats to it, X, Y, and Z. Cat is a complicated NBA player who is neither fantastic or terrible he just swings mm. a different way but he he is a starter on a team that just swept the phoenix suns and he is constantly giving his critics and his fans ammunition almost every game he plays well he also plays on Far and away the best defensive team in the NBA and just guarded Kevin Durant exactly. for a whole series and exactly. swept Exactly. You know? And Kyle, I wouldn't give his performance of guarding <laughs> Kevin Durant an A, but he did it. But he's the only one on uh, the all team season. of the, of the quote-unquote fours that passed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that, that, that's because a... Because Nas and Kyle just, it was not a Nas series. In the end, and it wasn't a Kyle Anderson series, and both those guys mm-hmm. are going to be vital if they do end up playing the defense. And champ. not for nothing, neither of those two guys is going to give you what Cat gives you on the offensive end. Nas does it, but Nas is not the automatic bucket that Cat is. Nas will give you 35 one night, and he'll give you 27 the next night. But somewhere in those five games is going to be an eight-point game. There's going to be a six-point game. And that's a growth thing for Nas. I'm not giving up on him because I ripped him early in his career, and I'm not going to do that again. But Learned your lesson. Essentially, exactly. <laughs> but essentially, he still has a level to go to get to where Cat is. Because Cat, Cat can get you 20 points on a bad night, 
just because he's a better he's a better offensive player. Do mm-hmm. you, you have any went, closing went, thoughts? Yeah, I do actually, because all the Paul Blart mall cop and self deprecating criticism has I'll, I'll close on a win for me. We went live after game eighty two, and I told you that this was not chess, this was not checkers, it was mm-hmm. boxing. This was not a chess series. Frank Vogel and the Suns did not. This is not back and forth. You win one game. This is not, you know, Cavs magic. This is a boxing match. And the Wolves came out in that game one and punched him right in the face. And to my credit, I look up to both of you, but I did say, because I got a lot of flack for this, I thought this was a better matchup than the Pelicans. At the time, the Pelicans might have had Zion or whatever. But um, I agree with you. Because I said, I watched a lot of these games too. The Suns had a glass jaw. And they won these four games by an average margin of 15 points a game. Right. They knocked him out every time. And tonight, when it was round 10 and the Suns were like, I got to make, uh, I got I to gotta knock out this opponent. Like, I got to kind of try to win this. I'm not going to win the decision. I'm going to win, like, by knocking him out. They took 82 from two of the best players in the league, and they still won. And the best player, we talked about this too, like, draft the players in the thing. Like, mm-hmm. before it was probably KD was the best player, and Booker's number two, and now Ant's three. And they were the best player in this series by a mile. And everything else doesn't matter. That's, that's why they won. Because they had the best player in the series, and he was phenomenal every time he touched the court. I'll close it with uh, just like a shout-out to Finch. Um, not just for his health, that first and foremost. That's, I, I just, as a person, feel for the guy right now. Right. This is going to be yeah. hard yeah. on a human level. Right. Um, of, like, that dude's competitive and he's going to want to compete. Like, I, I look forward to just someday, whether it be, you know, what, if he does the pot again or just talking to him. Like, Finch's competitiveness kind of fascinates me. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a unique sort it's, of... It's perfectly placed. Yeah. It's my favorite thing about him. Yeah. I mean, I've it, told you that I think Finch could walk away from the game. At the same time, I think that Finch really, really thrives in the game you know what that you know who that sounds like what Nikola Jokic oh yeah that's you know actually a really good comp I mean even not quite as good as your slow-mo comp for Nikola but you know, that's <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sticking on that one but actually that was, that, that's a good that's a great way to close it I will say one more thing it isn't Paul Blart it is Peter Falk <laughs> all right from the- Colombo <laughs> who always was being this self-deprecating guy no, but on Finch. You're going to get the I, wisdom. You're going to get the anachronisms, yeah, 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 yeah. too. This is, and maybe maybe you both would disagree, but to me, I actually left the arena tonight as a fan. Like, that should be 100%. Like, that should be the best of the best feeling for me. I said it was the best sports moment in my life. But to me, it was kind of like a 99 out of 100 because when we have Jim Pete on the pod, he said this. You've said this before. Chris Finch is the best coach this organization has ever had. Yes. And Flip Saunders was awesome. And meant a lot, but right, but there's no comparison. And it sucked that he didn't get to sit in that post game interview, mm-hmm. right? Like, so again, he's fine, health. I mean, not not in terms of his leg, but like he didn't die on us. But just the fact that he would I mean he has done as much, if not more, for this culture change and this bringing right. this team out of, as Glenn Taylor called it, decades of futility as Ant or Tim Connolly or owner, new owners, old owners, whatever. And, yeah, I mean, again, my heart goes out to him. I hope he has a quick recovery, and I hope he's able to still pull strings for all this because that man has changed this organization, in my opinion, more than anyone else. Right. And, and, and again, to, to, to talk about the, like, the hallway and when the guys were leaving the floor and coming back in, into the locker room, like... They were headed like, for Finch. Yeah, they, they were, and they were, like sprinting there like carl looked like borderline emotional like up and up, up like i thought it was i thought this would have been totally understandable of like being a little bit emotional about winning his first playoff series right. but i then gleaned that it was about he'd just gotten the news about finch's knee being bad and that that's a i mean ant is the the top line thing right. of why this team has has ascended but to the to the guidance point of what we're like chris finch is like a quiet thief and has been for for four years here and just on a being around him 
and just watching him, I guess, just and, and watching the way he interacts with people who are, you know, 30 years younger than him from a different background and all those sort of things. Um, he is a unique and, and, and special coach. And I, you know, as his knees laid up with ice right now, I, I just hope he's having a beer, you know, tonight right. and, and like reflecting on what he really fostered in here through when he was hired and what happened after, like he pulled this team out of a bad spot. He did. And they had the worst record in the NBA. Mm-hmm. The and day he was hired, he had the, the worst record in the NBA, and they were 29th or 30th in defense. And I don't, I don't want to sound like a fucking Hallmark movie here, but I contend after watching the replay, as Devin Booker kind of hip checks Mike Conley out of bounds, I contend that that Finch tried to catch Mike Conley from going out of bounds. And if that's – we use this word all the time on so many different levels, on so many different players. If he sacrificed himself to try to keep Mike out there, you know, who joked <laughs> – better finches needed mics yeah. um that sacrifice thing is real though right that you guys are in the locker room 82 nights a year whatever like there, there's a lot of personalities in that locker room mm-hmm. and we've always talked about you know when the offense was stagnant in january someone's you got to sacrifice and it's got to sacrifice from just being a gunner and a scorer to being a well-rounded player carl's got to sacrifice to play the four rudy has got to sacrifice not being you know the guy he was in utah you got to kind of play more in our system all these different guys have had to sacrifice, and it all, to me, spirals up to uh, what Britt has said, what Jim has said, when I think that the best coach this team has ever had. I I would like to get on the record as thinking I agree with that okay, as cool. well. Right. You, can, you can love me in there as well. All right. Um, let's, uh, yeah, let's wrap this up. Thank you guys uh, for, for doing this. Thank you uh, all for, for listening to our uh, more off-the-cuff uh, version version of the podcast. Uh, this was this was. I've never really been fun. on the cuff. That's true. I I was off the cuff. That's what I, I would say. Britt Brit gets mad when I send him outlines. Um, you don't send me outlines anymore. I learned. I learned. I learned my lesson. Like Paul Blart. I mean, you want me to think about what I'm going to say. It's not the way to get me to say things I, I want to say. I said I learned. I like I I'm I like Anthony Edwards. You were my professor, Conley. <laughs> um, he's Britt Robson. You can follow him on Twitter, at Britt Robson, um, writing uh, even more in, in the playoffs over at Min Post and Kyle, thank you just uh, for for being here and and doing this doing this series, and we'll get you back in Minnesota as we figure out this this schedule as well. This is gonna be fun. It's uh, it is kind of only the beginning. Um, I am like since I was in Denver after that game that they lost, I've been like really hoping we would get to this moment. Um, I love this stuff. Like, I, I, this is going to be a fun one, basketball wise, to to get into. It and, is. It's going to uh, be a glorious series. It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a blast. So, uh, that'll be fun. I don't. We're all flying back tomorrow. Kind of figure out the schedule. Maybe take a day or two it's looking off. Looking like from Saturday. The yeah, depending on what happens yeah, with the, the Lakers Nuggets. win, maybe not. But yeah, um, yeah. But just to the listeners from uh, from that standpoint of you know just kind of. I'm not sure what, what the next podcast will be, but we'll we'll get it going and we'll start digging into to Denver when when the time comes there. Uh, yeah, congratulations to you that are, have devoted time into this. Uh, we we appreciate you. Until uh, the next episode, probably with Jace. He's Britt. He's Kyle. I'm Dane. Peace out. How I'm feeling, man, I hope it never stops, yeah Green and hot so you can find me in the crowd, yeah, yeah Don't let standards ever, ever bring you down, yeah